Can you imagine defeating the all-powerful Roman Empire on their own turf, Italy? Spartacus accomplished this extraordinary feat from an extremely disadvantaged position, being nothing more than a slave. He gathered a group of escapees and slaves to take on the Roman army against all odds, winning one battle after another. Records and quotations from historians such as Plutarch and Apian of Alexandria indicate that Spartacus was most likely born in Thrace, a town to the north of Macedonian territory. Spartacus was a village in Thrace, and since it was common at the time for Roman slaves to be named after their origin, Spartacus was probably given this name once he became a gladiator. His real name, however, is unknown. People from Thrace were very much frowned upon by the Romans, as they considered all those who came from that region to be barbarians and not fit to live in an advanced society such as the Roman one. Nevertheless, Plutarch's descriptions show that Spartacus was not comparable to these Thracian stereotypes. The historian wrote that Spartacus was gifted with remarkable intelligence and acumen, as well as pointing out his extremely elevated level of culture. In Plutarch's own words, Spartacus was more Greek than Thracian. But this is where the story of Spartacus starts to blur, as there are no accurate and reliable records of his life in Thrace. Presumably, he started out as a shepherd, but in ancient Thrace this was hardly an easy job. He had to contend with wolves, bears, and bandits, which may have awakened in him the urge to fight. Spartacus therefore turned away from his beasts to become a soldier. The writings of Apian of Alexandria provide scant information, stating only that Spartacus was a Thracian who fought against the Romans at one point in his life and was then defeated, captured, and sold into slavery. On the other hand, if we look at the records left by the historian Publius Annius Florus, we are told that Spartacus was originally a Roman mercenary who served the Republic directly in some legions as an auxiliary soldier. Auxiliaries were non-Roman soldiers who used lighter weapons and fought together with the legions. If this were really the case, then it would explain how Spartacus gained a thorough knowledge of the Romans' warfare approach, which he used to devastating effect against them. Publius Florus described how Spartacus' service as a soldier was ruined at some point by accusations of desertion and theft resulting in him becoming a slave and later a gladiator on account of his physical prowess. But Plutarch actually gives an account similar to that of Publius Florus, which may add weight to this account. Yet Plutarch adds a few more details. According to him, Spartacus was a soldier who fought for Rome's honor and glory, but who, at a certain point, for unknown reasons, defected. Interestingly, he wasn't caught alone as the historian tells us that the Thracian warrior was with his wife when he was captured. He further describes this woman as a prophetess of the Thracian people. Spartacus, now a slave, found himself at the bottom tier of Roman society, as slaves often led deplorable lives. Most of these people, who ended up being taken to Rome after the campaigns in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, were extremely useful to the Roman economy assigned to work in agriculture or mining in places like Sicily and southern Italy. Having grueling working hours, these people were handled very harshly. Under Roman law, a slave was a piece of property, not a person. Owners could abuse, injure, or even kill their slaves without legal consequences. Despite there being many levels and types of slaves, the lowest and most numerous, who worked in the fields and mines, were forced to undergo a life of hard physical labor. But the oppression that the Romans inflicted on these tens of thousands of slaves brought profound consequences. Between 135 and 104 BC, two major crises occurred in Rome due to its slaves. These were the First and Second Servile Wars, which mainly unfolded in Sicily. Weary of daily suffering and ongoing oppression, tens of thousands of slaves took it upon themselves to fight against Roman power. Both the First and Second Servile Wars were ultimately unsuccessful, as the rebels, despite being numerous, were poorly structured and had few chances of winning. And while the revolts brought problems for the Roman Republic, taking several years to be quelled finally, the Senate did not see these events as a threat. 
They believed that a professional and trained Roman army would never be defeated by a mob of rebellious slaves. This carefree attitude on the part of the Roman elites, meanwhile, would soon end when the Third Servile War began. Spartacus had all the hallmarks of a gladiator. He was a fierce fighter, adept with weapons, and, according to the law, was already sentenced to death. The people responsible for his capture decided to sell him as a gladiator, ready to thrill the crowds in the arenas. Spartacus and a group of men found themselves in Lentulus Batiatus's school, known for preparing gladiators for the performances put on for the people of Capua. Lentulus Batiatus was a well-known lanista in charge of training gladiators for arena battles. Spartacus and his companions were subjected to rigorous training, where they learned combat techniques and improved their skills. Still, Spartacus had much greater ambitions than simply making it through the gladiatorial rounds. He started to form a secret alliance among the other gladiators and persuaded around 200 of them to join together to defy Roman power and seek their freedom. Around 73 BC, Spartacus and 200 other gladiators decided to escape. But during their attempt, they were found out, which forced them to fight. The story goes that, Lacking conventional weapons such as swords and spears, they used everything they had available in the kitchen, such as knives and skewers. Some 70 of the 200 men managed to break out, and to protect themselves, they packed a suitable number of gladiators' weapons and armor. They were now free, but there was no time to celebrate, as the Republic would hunt them down. The men decided to act. One of their first steps was to select their leaders. Three people were selected two of whom were former Gaulish slaves called Crixus and Onimus, as well as Spartacus himself. Using their improvised weapons and fighting abilities, the fugitive gladiators succeeded in persuading the guards at the city gates not to stand in their way. It's a bit difficult to say for sure what happened from that point on, as the sources are fairly vague and imprecise. Spartacus and his men are believed to have fought and defeated some soldiers who were sent to stop their escape. After this triumph, his group looted and pillaged some places in the Capua region. Later on, knowing that 70 men could never survive for long against the gigantic Roman troops, Spartacus allegedly tried to recruit even more soldiers for his group while he was in Capua. Once he had succeeded in this, he ordered his troops to withdraw from there heading for Mount Vesuvius, where they took up position. Reports of Spartacus's escape quickly spread, drawing in a growing number of slaves who would rather live as fugitives than be held captive by the Romans. These new recruits comprised both slaves born in captivity and soldiers taken during Rome's many wars. Rome then decided to respond resolutely to this uprising. There were several reasons for that. Firstly, they hoped to contain the criminal and rebellious behavior of Spartacus's men. But they also had another motivation. Spartacus's attacks took place in the Campania region, a location that Rome's wealthy and powerful loved to spend their vacations and leisure time in. On top of that, the area was crowded with properties owned by the most diverse Republic authorities, which made them want to quickly ditch anything that could hinder their leisure the decision was made to crush Spartacus's revolt swiftly. To do so, the praetor Gaius Claudius Glaber was told to gather troops to fight the rebellious gladiators. But Gaius Claudius did not succeed in assembling the regular legions that routinely fought for the Republic. Instead, he put together a mixture of militiamen and other inexperienced men. Although his soldiers were not Rome's best, they were numerous, numbering 3,000 men. They headed for Mount Vesuvius, where Spartacus and his men had positioned themselves. However, believing that these slaves would not be worth the risk of losing his troops unnecessarily, Gaius Claudius adopted a more conservative plan. He ordered his men to obstruct the only known way down the mountain, to prevent the insurgents led by Spartacus from escaping or obtaining supplies. He then basically decided to wait it out, hoping that hunger and a lack of resources would soon cause his enemies to capitulate. But Gaius Claudius quickly found out that he had underestimated his opponents. He was not wrong in believing that the men led by Spartacus lacked sophisticated and up-to-date training. But 
To offset this shortcoming, the men had many other cards up their sleeves, including their resourcefulness and shrewdness. They hatched an ingenious plan. With Claudius believing that they would starve to death before long, Spartacus's men were free to move. To overcome the siege, Spartacus and his men made ropes and ladders out of vines and trees growing on the slopes of Vesuvius. These materials were used to build a kind of improvised abseil, allowing them to descend the mountainside, setting themselves up on a side that Claudius's troops had left unguarded, as they believed that no one would be able to move around Vesuvius, except along the route that they controlled. Spartacus's troops then managed to get around the mountain, and, in rapid movements, outflanked Claudius's men, who, utterly astonished and stunned by the gladiator's feat, were defeated quite easily. Spartacus had achieved a tremendous victory. After years of slavery, he had finally struck a blow against the Romans. As for the pretentious Claudius, we don't know exactly what happened to him. After the battle at Vesuvius, he was never mentioned again in Roman records. There are two possibilities. He either died in battle, which is the most likely scenario, or he managed to escape and was then deemed irrelevant enough to be mentioned. Spartacus's achievement meant that he could equip his men with Roman military gear while attracting a growing number of escapees to join him. His success, however, had consequences. As his fame spread, more people joined Spartacus's cause, heightening the need to undertake ever more daring incursions to support his followers. Although Italy had less than 10,000 gladiators in total, Spartacus was leading an impressive 40,000-strong army by the end of 73 BC. This group's rapacious antics drew an increasingly violent response from the Romans, unwilling to let the threat of slaves go unchecked. Spartacus mainly aimed his attacks at lands inhabited by hopeless slaves or impoverished peasants who had lost everything. As he made his way through the cities, the underprivileged would welcome him with open arms, joining in the plundering of their oppressor's wealth. The rightful distribution of the spoils by Spartacus helped with recruitment, strengthening his ranks even more. After Claudius and his men were defeated on Mount Vesuvius, another praetor was appointed to tackle the troubles instigated by Spartacus. The chosen one this time was Publius Verinius, who brought with him two trusted men, Furius and Cocinius. Plutarch noted that Verinius chose to divide his forces, placing around 2,000 men under Furius's command. Like the previous attempt led by Claudius, Verinius believed he would have little trouble disposing of those slaves. And also like his predecessor, his fate was not entirely pleasant. Spartacus's men inflicted another humiliating defeat on the Romans, killing Cassinius and narrowly capturing Verinius. To top it off, they managed to secure a considerable amount of military equipment from the beaten Romans, with Spartacus donning the robes of a Roman magistrate. Spartacus and his troops managed to enlist even more men in their group after this triumph, and their fame grew. That small ragtag group of 70 men, who had escaped from a gladiator school in Capua, turned into an army of more than 70,000 warriors, ready to follow Spartacus and march on Rome. The year was already too advanced for any attempt to cross the Alps. Spartacus decided to head south, looking to establish his rule in the Lucania and Brutuium regions. To bolster his army, Spartacus banned gold and silver from entering the cities he controlled, but he did encourage iron imports and sought out skilled blacksmiths to make weapons and armor for his new recruits. Spartacus's objective was to return to the north no longer as a gang, but as a powerful army. As his power grew, he became an ever more severe problem for the Romans. They doubled down and dispatched a large army to counter this rebellion. Having triumphed against the troops of the praetors Claudius Glaber and Publius Varanius, and with over 70,000 men under his command, Spartacus was ready to take the next steps in his uprising. Contrary to what it may seem, his troops were much more dispersed and less centralized than a conventional army. This resulted in unpredictable actions, to say the least, in some situations. This uncertainty became even more pronounced after the rebellion's main leaders, Spartacus and Crixus, began to fall out. 
Some historians argue that the primary reasons for this split were the strategic prospects of these two warriors, since Spartacus most likely wished to take his troops to the north of Italian territory, aiming to cross the Alps and head for Thrace or Gaul, demonstrating his wish to end hostilities. But historical records indicate that Crixus disagreed completely with this strategy and wanted to advance against Rome directly while continuing to plunder and loot the valuable regions of southern Italy. This interpretation of events is primarily due to the lists written by the historian and poet Publius Annius Florus, who documented advances made by Spartacus's troops against the regions of Thuri and Metapontum, geographically distant from Nola and Nuceria, where Spartacus's troops were based and recruited. According to Florus, a raid in such distant regions would denote the presence of two factions within the rebel troops. Furthermore, he tells us about an attack by Lucius Gellius, who at one point advanced against troops led by Crixus, comprising just over 30,000 men. Plutarch also mentions a possible rift between the insurgent troops. In some of his writings, he claims that the insurgents were divided into those who wanted to fight their way to freedom and those who wanted to seek wealth and revenge against Rome. Also, some authors argue that one of the main drivers of this rebel split was Onimaus's death, who led the men together with Spartacus and Crixus, but who ended up dying in some of the innumerable battles fought against the Roman troops. Disagreements aside, most men still followed Spartacus's lead. Around the spring of 72 BC, the rebel troops started to move, breaking out of their winter camps and heading north. But the Romans were already weary of the constant looting and vandalism by Spartacus and his men. The Senate gathered to take action against them, seeking to obliterate them all. The consuls Publius Valerius Poplicola and Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus Claudanius assembled a large number of soldiers and went into battle. As the Romans marched, Spartacus's forces, too large to advance as a single troop, were divided. Crixus led some of the men and Spartacus the others in a bid to cross the Apennines and allow his followers to return to their homes. Aware of this division of the rebels, the Romans chose to attack both troops separately, with Poplica pushing forward against Crixus's forces and Claudianus charging at the men led by Spartacus. Initially, Poplica was remarkably effective in his advance, killing more than two-thirds of the forces under Crixus's within a brief time along with Crixus himself, who was defeated near Mount Gargano. Spartacus, meanwhile, was leading the rest of the rebels northwards. Upon reaching the river Po, they avoided a face-off. While his army was numerous, he lacked the same maneuverability as the well-trained Roman soldiers, putting him at a disadvantage. With Consul Lentulus's army to the north and the other Consul Poplica quickly approaching from the south, Spartacus found himself cornered between the two. Against all odds, Spartacus succeeded in defeating first one army and then the other. The way in which Spartacus accomplished this astonishing victory is mysterious, as the Romans, mortified by their loss at the hands of rebellious slaves, kept the details a secret. Following the triumph, Spartacus chose to honor the memory of his former ally Crixus by ordering the sacrifice of 300 Roman prisoners in his memory. In an act of revenge and retaliation against the Romans, he ordered the remaining prisoners to be used for the entertainment of his troops, fighting as gladiators. On this event, the writer Publius Florus wrote that Spartacus's men dragged the Romans to fight each other on the funeral pyres of their fallen officers. In his words, as if they wished to put an end to all their past disgrace for having become, instead of a gladiator, a provider of gladiatorial displays. Spartacus then asked his men to smash up all the wagons and supplies they couldn't use, and resumed his march, now totaling an impressive 120,000-man infantry and an unknown number of cavalry, as increased volunteers joined them each day. It is unknown precisely where they were going, with some authors claiming that their initial goal was to advance against the city of Rome, while others claimed that they wanted to redeploy, awaiting the forthcoming attacks and battles. Shortly after, in early 71 BC, Spartacus's forces started moving further south for unknown reasons. Having seen their actions, Rome once again decided to attack them. Nothing less than two armies were sent to crush Spartacus and his men, 
But once again, the insurgents utterly defeated them. As the historian Appian put it, the war had been going on for three years and it caused the Romans great concern, despite having initially been ridiculed and dismissed as trivial because it involved gladiators. It was also deeply embarrassing for the powerful Roman Republic, which brought practically all its opponents to their knees, to fail to defeat a pack of slaves and gladiators. Such a situation had to end, quickly. Poplica and Claudianus's leadership had proved weak and ineffective, and they were swiftly dismissed from their prestigious positions in the Roman Senate. But there was a genuine issue. Spartacus had struck fear into the Roman elite. Having defeated so many prestigious warriors, no one wanted to command the troops that would go against him. There was also a widespread lack of confidence among the Romans that the consuls could ultimately defeat Spartacus, who was in his third year of struggle for freedom. The ferocious resistance and consecutive victories of the rebel leader had shattered the Roman people's confidence in their own army and its leaders. The man in charge of stopping Spartacus's rebellion had to have great financial, military, and political skills. Without them, he would never be able to accomplish this difficult deed. That man, however, was found. His name was Marcus Licinius Crassus, a powerful Roman elite personality, the richest man in the entire Republic, and an experienced army commander who served under General Sulla in 82 BC. Crassus set about mobilizing a massive army to put an end to the rebellion once and for all. Crassus, now responsible for leading the efforts against Spartacus, took over as Praetor and started the necessary remodeling to achieve victory. He appointed six new legions, as well as the two consular legions of Gallius and Publius Lentulus, to be reorganized and prepared. It should be pointed out that he was very successful and quickly managed to gather between 32,000 and 48,000 infantry troops, plus auxiliaries, into his army. But Crassus was not stopping there. He passionately believed that Rome's earlier defeats were not only caused by the weak leadership of the commanders, but also by the soldiers' indiscipline and inexperience. Based on these insights, Crassus resorted to harsh treatment of his commanders. In many cases, he was downright brutal by ordering the reinstatement of an ancient punishment called decimation. The word decimation comes from Latin and means removal of a tenth. It was a form of Roman military discipline where every tenth man in a group was put to death. Roman army commanders used discipline to sanction units or large groups guilty of capital crimes such as cowardice, mutiny, desertion, and insubordination, as well as being used to appease rebellious legions. These punishments had the desired effect, to the extent that the historian Appian states that Crassus was viewed by his men in a more fearful fashion than a defeat at the hands of an enemy. Once everything was ready, the moment was ripe for action. Spartacus decided to retreat and set up camp in the south. Soon he found himself surrounded by merchants trying to retrieve the goods looted by his troops. Spartacus quickly wanted to flee Italy, and the situation became even more urgent when Crassus's army raided and massacred an isolated group of around 10,000 rebellious slaves. Having learned that Spartacus and his troops were in southern Italy, Crassus stationed six of his legions on the region's borders and assigned his ally Lucius Mummius with two legions to maneuver behind Spartacus. Plutarch tells us in his writings that Spartacus made a deal with pirates to take him and around 2,000 of his men to Sicily, where he planned to ignite a slave revolt and gather reinforcements. But he was betrayed by the pirates, who took the payment and then abandoned the rebels. It is reported that this stirred up a major disturbance among Spartacus's troops. They reportedly tried to build rafts or makeshift ships to attempt to escape but Crassus undertook unspecified measures to guarantee that the rebels would not cross into Sicily, causing Spartacus to give up his escape attempt. Crassus then made his army move with speed, building a system of ditches and walls 60 kilometers long that ended up imprisoning Spartacus, now with dams in front and the sea behind him, which made movement virtually impossible. As a result, Mummius, instructed not to engage Spartacus's men, felt confident and decided to advance. 
as he believed he had spotted a wonderful opportunity, but he failed and was defeated. After this loss, Crassus turned out to be more competent than Mummius and achieved a few successes in certain battles where he decimated more than 6,000 warriors commanded by Spartacus without achieving a decisive victory. He forced Spartacus and his men to move south through Lucania while Crassus gained more ground. The rebels were now under siege and running out of supplies. During this stage, Spartacus's troops were once again torn apart, perhaps due to disagreements between those who wanted to continue plundering and those who were looking for an escape from Italy. There may also have been ethnic tensions between the distinct groups following Spartacus, with most of those who split being Gauls. Crassus attacked these breakaway strongholds and managed to wipe out around 30,000 men. He could have inflicted more casualties had it not been for Spartacus's intervention. During this battle, the Romans recovered the eagles that had been lost to the slaves during previous clashes. Watching the situation, Spartacus appeared to have been planning to take his army back to the Alps, as they encountered little resistance from that direction. But Crassus soon realized that he did not need to rush after them, as the slave army had turned around and was ready to fight a battle. But then a surprising event occurred. The Roman Senate, displeased with Crassus, considering that he was not moving fast enough. This disgruntlement began to grow as Sextus Pompey had just come back from his raids in Hispania. Capitalizing on this coincidence, the Senate promptly ordered Pompey's forces to head south to assist Crassus. But the latter was deeply concerned, as he believed that Pompey would steal his glory. He therefore ordered his troops to move at full pace to defeat Spartacus as quickly as possible, to prevent Pompey from meddling in the fighting. Amid all this struggle for power and glory, Spartacus spotted an opportunity to take some kind of advantage. He strategically decided to bargain with Crassus, believing that he would agree to his terms for fear of losing his position to Pompey. But his strategy was fruitless, as Crassus rebuffed it. The crucial moment had come. Spartacus knew it. He commanded his troops to assemble and decided to carry out a symbolic act. According to Plutarch, he ordered his horse to be brought. In a move which surprised all men, Spartacus killed the animal. He then stated that, if he were to triumph that day, he would have plenty of horses from the defeated Romans to choose from. On the other hand, he said that if he were defeated, he would not need any horses. Spartacus ordered his men to charge with fierceness against the Romans in what were initially extraordinarily successful actions. His troops succeeded in killing several Roman guards and penetrating the Roman defenses. Spartacus and around 50,000 rebels managed to break through Crassus's defenses, threatening the Roman leader's position. Along the banks of the river Sel, Spartacus's army finally met Crassus's Roman legions on the open battlefield. The end was near. The former gladiators then charged into the Roman ranks, slamming into a wall of shields and swords. While the rebels fought hard and took down many Roman soldiers, they also sustained heavy casualties in the process. Spartacus gathered his troops and led an advance against Crassus. Several of Crassus's troops had been destroyed. Hoping for a direct confrontation with the Roman leader, Spartacus pushed forward frantically to meet him within all the chaos taking place on the battlefield. He even slew two centurions in his search for Crassus, but by then, Spartacus's triumph was impossible. Although his men were brave, they were not a professionally trained and well-prepared army, which made defeating an immense and highly qualified force like Crassus's virtually unfeasible. According to the historian Appian, he was injured in his leg by a spear, but fell to one knee and held his shield in front of him, unwilling to give up the fight. Then his men began to desert, sensing imminent defeat. The brave Spartacus was surrounded by Roman legionnaires. Wounded and facing certain death, he chose to fight until his last breath, before dropping dead on the battlefield. Spartacus's final vicious attack drew the Romans' reluctant admiration. Even Publius Florus, who usually considered Spartacus and his followers to be verging on savage, admitted that on this final occasion, they died like men, fighting to the end, as one would expect from those led by a gladiator. 
Spartacus himself died in a way befitting a leader, courageously fighting in the front line. Near the end, with victory all but assured, Pompey's troops finally appeared and quickly defeated the remaining warriors, capturing several other deserters. 6,000 survivors of Spartacus's army were then crucified along the Appian Way from Rome to Capua, and their bodies laid to rot there for years as a warning against future insurrections. But Spartacus's body was gone. Oddly enough, even though enemies surrounded him when he died, the Romans could not find his body after the battle. The Romans wanted to display the corpse to deter those who hoped Spartacus would survive and return. This attempt would perhaps have prevented him from becoming the legend he eventually became. Following this, much to Crassus's misfortune, Pompey sent a direct message to the Senate, declaring that he had been the main culprit in the victory over Spartacus. This message was well received and Pompey got most of the glory, bringing to fruition Crassus's initial fears. Pompey and Crassus later enjoyed political benefits for having suppressed the rebellion, with both returning to Rome with their legions. In a move that illustrated how powerful they were, they refused to dispense with their troops, ordering them to camp outside Rome. They were elected consuls in 70 BC, partly due to the implied threat of their armed legions camping outside the city. The end of the Third Roman Servile War, directly and indirectly, ultimately benefited the slaves in the medium and long term. In the following decades, new laws and regulations started to be enacted, allowing the lives of these people to become a little less painful and making them remember Spartacus, the slave and gladiator who defied Rome. He ended up going down in history as one of the greatest warriors of all time. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like it and subscribe to our channel.